Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for spending your Friday evening with us um, if you're in the UK. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce James. I wanted to say a little bit about myself in the Think Lab. I'm the manager of the University of Cambridge Think Lab. We co-host events with um, Sarah and the Intellectual Forum. A lot of widely interdisciplinary events, so look forward to those as Sarah had just mentioned, but enough about me and our staff. We're introducing James Wallman today, who studied entrepreneurship at the Judge Business School here at Cambridge, and he's the author of two international best-selling books, one of which is Stuffication, and the other of which um, I'm currently reading, so maybe James can sign my ebook when I'm done with it, um, Time and How to Spend It, which has uh, been quite interesting. So James is a futurist who spent years working with large-scale organizations across the globe. His work focuses, and he'll talk more about it, the experience economy and rethinking the experiences, how much they've changed during, especially during the last year of COVID lockdown when the when that, perhaps the breadth of our experiences um, has contracted a little bit. How do we get more into the depth of those experiences and what might that mean? So um, with that being said, I will welcome James Wallman for our event. Thanks, Tyler. Um, thanks for having me, guys. Really nice to be here. I, I feel like a fraud given this is the intellectual forum, but I shall do my best to at least be interesting, if not intellectual. Uh, hello, everybody. Hope you're well. Uh, if you're in the UK, hope you had a great day and welcome to Friday, the weekend. And I don't know about you, but as the, as the week goes on, I start to think about the weekend and what we might do. Obviously, at the moment, we're all stuck to our postcodes and we're all stuck home and it's all very <laughs> kind of frustrating. Um, but how we spend our time, I think, is really important. I think I'm going to get straight into this presentation. I got a deck to share with you. I think we can have some fun here. I hope you'll find it fun. I look forward to hearing some of your questions as well. So this was the putative title that we gave this and I played with it a little bit more. And I can operate a PowerPoint. I'm sure I can do this. There we go. But I wanted to call it design of the times, partly because I'm an ex-journalist, oh, I kind of am a journalist, you know, sign of the times is something interesting, but I think we should all think about how we design our time. And this is something from um, 2015. If you cast your minds back, 2015, so what we're looking about five years ago or so, it was an amazing year for me. My son was born, my beautiful boy, and it was, uh, it was absolutely fantastic. But it wasn't the highlight of the year. This was the highlight of the year. My brother took me to this event and I think maybe if you're a person of a certain age, that music really hits you somewhere quite deeply and it's quite an emotional thing. But this, was, is an this is from a company called Secret Cinema, run by a guy called Fabian Riggle. Wonderful experiences, really well considered and designed. They really think about the before, the during and the after. They think about raising your anticipation beforehand, which is free happiness and, and, and excites you about what you're going to see. And they design these things in a way that's based around the idea of the hero's journey. I'll talk about that in a bit. And it throws you into an adventure. It takes you away from where you've come from and gives you something that is quite transformative. And here I am five years later. And even when I contacted my brother today and I, I, I um, called him and I texted him saying, did he have any pictures from the night? And you can't take your phone inside. Wonderful, they take your phone away from you. So you're actually there in the moment. And sadly, he didn't have any pictures, but we did talk for about 10 minutes when he was supposed to be in another call, simply because we were excited about it and talking about it. And that year as well, around that time, this book had come out. And this is an important thing. This Forget the name stuff occasionally. The important bit is the bit in the middle, how we've had enough of stuff and why you need experience more than ever. And this was, um, it was the first book that I'd written. This was the self-published um, cover that I had put together. And the book's about two things. It's about the shift from materialism as our dominant value system to something I call experientialism. And when I was first pitching that idea to people uh, 10, uh, you know, eight years ago, five years ago, six years ago, et cetera, people thought it was kind of nuts. Hence, I couldn't get a publisher, but it kind of got caught, picked up. It was pub it was um, covered in the Financial Times, in Fast Company, in The Sun, and then Penguin bought it and it took off. It went to number three. I was on ABC in Australia, CBC um, in Canada, MSNBC in the States, the BBC over here. And the book was two things, therefore, this move to experientialism as we move from 
we've got enough stuff. We, uh, that's why I was saying before, sorry, Sarah, about how it's not about stuff. This is about experiences, okay? Um, we now want experiences because we know it's the best place to find happiness and um, the, the status and meaning in our lives. But also the book was a, a, a sort of a cri de coeur, as a call to arms. It was, if you want to be happy in your life, spend less on stuff, spend more on experiences, because that's what the science now shows. And I think a lot of us know this nowadays, and when you use the term experientialism, people understand what it means. So this book then came out, and it came out internationally as well. And um, the follow-on from that was this book, Time and How to Spend It. And this, this partly came from when I was in interviews with people giving uh, talks like this or in the real world, um, because before COVID, of course, we'd never heard of lockdown, had we? So, you know, I'd give a keynote and people would say to me, OK, great, James, you're saying spend less on stuff, spend more on experiences. What kind of experiences should I choose? Actually, the first time I was asked this, I was at the RSA in London, Royal Society of Arts, and this man's son He'd asked, he wanted to take his son to the Okavango Delta in Botswana. And his son said to him, I don't want to go there. I'd rather just watch it on TV and stay here and play my Xbox. And he, this man wanted my opinion. He basically wanted me to back him up to say why his son should go with him to, you know, to Botswana. Obviously, I said to him, I'll, I'll go with him if he's lonely. Uh, I'd be very happy to join him on the trip. But I couldn't give an opinion. I had an opinion, but I didn't know. I didn't know what the answer was because each of us, um, you know, there's 160, 161 people, 160, okay, it's going up slightly, but there's there's a lot of people on this call and all of us will enjoy different things. You know, I've got an old friend called Fiona who still likes raving. I've got friends who like heavy metal music and going to those kind of concerts. I've got friends that like surfing, I've got people that hate all those different things. We all like slightly different things. And I wanted to have an answer. So when someone said to me, what kind of experiences I, I could give an answer. So what I did was, uh, as uh, I guess probably lots of us do, is I went and found people cleverer than me people who studied uh you know pe you know pro people with proper research degrees at cambridge and oxford and the lsc and mit and nyu and stanford and ucla and uh nyu and tokyo and you know other great universities around the world and looked at the research they've done i talked to the people and i tried uh, to not only read all these papers but try to distill them into something that was practical for people. I read this book, The Checklist Manifesto um, by Atul Gawande. It's very clear that checklists are a great way to help people do things. When things go from simple to complex, humans get a bit confused. And there's so many, you know, if you, if you read the papers, there's always a new thing about what you should do to be happy. There's always a new thing, what you should do to be more successful. And I wanted to bring it all into something that was practical. So I turned it into um, a seven rule, seven principle framework, um, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, it took, a, it took, anyway, it, it, it took months of like playing with all the data to try and come up with something that was, was close enough to what the scientists say and practical. It was like, you know, this is like a, a set of seven tools, if you like. And if you use these seven tools, it will help you uh, be more uh, happy, uh, wealthy, successful, resilient, etc. cetera. Um, the FT named it a book of the year in 2019 when it came out, which was nice. And you might be thinking, this sounds, but I'm happy for you, James. Well done, you and your book. But actually, I know what I'm doing with my time. And that would that would be my 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 reaction if someone said to me that I'll tell you what you should do with your weekend and how to spend your holidays. But this is from me high cheek sent me high, the guy who came up with the concept of flow. The popular assumption is that no skills are involved in enjoying free time and that anybody can do it. But the evidence suggests the opposite. Free time is more difficult to enjoy than work. How insane is that as a thought? Okay. Leisure does not improve the quality of life unless you know how to use it effectively. And it's by no means something that you learn automatically. So there's a place for this stuff because we all just think this is easy, but actually it takes a skill. And the problem is we don't learn this. It's not something we get taught. Um, okay, so imagine for a moment a bank account that credits your account every morning with $86,400, euros, pounds, whatever your currency is. And then, then at the end of the day, it deletes whatever you've got left. OK, there's no interest. There's no, you know, you can't keep the money. Once it's gone, it's gone. What would you do with that money? What would you do each day? Now, when I'm giving a talk in a place with like real people who can actually respond to me, um, somebody always will, you know, put up a hand and say. I'll spend it all. I'll spend as much of it as I possibly can. And I hope that you're thinking this because otherwise, what, you know, that, that money's gone, okay? And then I say, why do you think it's 86,400? And there's usually another kind of pause and somebody says, that's how many seconds there are in the day. 
And that's the point that I'm trying to make here. Once that time is gone, it's gone. You can't get it back. The magic of spending money and wasting money is it's just money. You can go get more money. But with your time, you can't. We have our time. Sure, you can extend it slightly by eating more vegetables. Sure, you can go running each day. You can do strength training. You can do some things to stretch your time a little bit more. But the truth is our time is finite. So knowing how to spend it is absolutely critical. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, this is all from sociologists, economists, psychologists, etc. These are the seven core reasons um, that it seems that we're really struggling with time today, more than in the past, and why I think this book is relevant now. Back, you know, some years ago, it wasn't so relevant. Um, let's pick out number three there. So many emails. Think about the incoming messages. Think about, you know, the, the Instagram, the Telegram, the, the more than having more than one email, the text. Uh, tweets there's so many choices that we have okay forget that right now we don't have all those choices think about the phones that we have they're always with us number seven lacking education people want to go get an mba they want to learn how to be better at digital marketing and understanding social media we learn the skills of production at school that's what the 20th century has bequeathed us but we don't learn the skills of consumption of how to spend our time so we don't know about this stuff either okay when it comes to food we know more nowadays about the stuff that's good for us than the stuff that's not so good for us. And the thing is, you know, that you come across this term of superfood. Superfood is a, is a bit of a marketing term, but the concept is, is pretty solid. There are certain foods that will give you, uh, you know, brighter eyes, uh, more able to uh, run fast, um, concentrate more. And there are foods that aren't. And when it comes to food, we know. So once you know that about food, you eat more of the good stuff maybe not during lockdown, I think we can all give ourselves a bit of a break and eat the wrong things, but we try to eat more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. Because if you didn't know that a Big Mac wasn't the sort of thing you should eat all the time, you might eat more Big Macs. And it's the same with time. Some things that you do will build your resilience, will lead you to be happier and more successful, and some things won't. Not knowing how to spend your time is like burning money. Okay, so here's the seven rule checklist. It's story transformation outside and offline relationships intensity extraordinary and status and significance that spells stories if you read it down s-t-o-r-i-e-s i could talk you through that and i've done this many times with people i've run courses on it as well obviously it's in the book um and i'll kind of jump into a few but we're going to get so I, I, we're going to play a little bit more i think but you're welcome to ask me questions about those as we go so Story, you'll see here, crucial. I think it's a crucial part of the domino line to happiness. Story, if, you, if you've read uh, Will Storr's book, uh, The Science of Storytelling, if you've read Into the Woods, if you watch TV or follow ads, story is how, or oh, Sapiens, you will know Harari's book, story is the evolutionary adaptation that's enabled humans to come together in large groups to rise from about midway up the uh, food chain to rise to the very top. It's the thing that's enabled us to create societies. And story brings, brings us close to other people through this magical thing called mirror neurons. When you tell a story, the neurons in somebody else's brain fire up too. That is the a physical manifestation of empathy according to neuroscientists. That creates connection. Connection leads to relationship. Relationships is the route to happiness and to longer lives as well. Um, I could talk to you a bit more about how to design flow. Flow is essential for, um, for being successful, for being creative and for being happy. And there are the, if you follow this eight rule structure, you are more likely to create flow in your life. Just think about the number of times in the past a uh, few months when you've been trying to get some work done and one of those people in your house one of those lovely but annoying people comes in and disturbs you and it just it throws you out and this is one of the things why you should always have your phone in a different room to the one where you're working keep it away from you risk is really interesting here too few people want to avoid risk but risk is awesome think about when you're sailing and you might capsize or maybe that's me because i'm a bad sailor or you're doing a piece of work and you might fail but having that slight fear is really good for you um, people talk about the peak end rules, quite a big thing uh, from psychologists. I, I like to talk about the B rules, beginnings, extremes and ends. The reason for this is when you design an experience, um, there are three people you're designing for. The anticipating self, the person before the experience, the person who's having the experience, the, that's called the experiencing self by the psychologist, and the remembering self. Just think about a great weekend in your life or your wedding or a stag do or a bachelorette party or you know some experience that you had the experience lasts three days or a week or whatever 
but looking for the, the, the run up to it is just free happiness. So I would encourage, I, I do this to people in courses that I run, book something in now. I know it's very difficult to do that. I spoke to someone the other day who's booked a holiday, uh, but with the knowledge that it may need to move. But book in one of those friends of yours that isn't in your postcode that you can't even take a walk with, you know, two meter gap at the moment. And uh, because that's just free happiness. And then but when you think about the design of experience, you should think about the remembering self because you will enjoy any experience for many years. Think about this secret cinema thing I went to with my brother. We were there for like four or five hours. Five years later, we're still still talking about. It. So the beavles are really important because what happens at the beginning and the end and the extremes, the peak moments, you may have heard it called, are the things that we remember much more than the other stuff. If you think about life, most of it's a kind of gray flat line that you don't particularly remember most things that happen. But when something happens, when it's in an extreme, you remember it. So when you think about your time, try and make sure you design the beginning, design the ends, make something happen there and think about those extremes as well. Um, so I've used this. So if you, it's called, as you know, time and how to spend it. It's also time and how to design it. So I've also kind of taken this idea of the hero's journey um, with designers and uh, some people in my team to turn this into something that time experienced designers can use to design better experiences. And you can see, I don't know, it's obviously, I have no idea how well you know the hero's journey, but what happens is you get the ordinary world where something is okay, but people are a bit kind of uh, not sure about it. You get the call to adventure. The, you meet the mentor, this is Obi-Wan from Star Wars, but it could be anywhere. And this is where you, um, you jump across the threshold. Disney call it going down the, um, the tunnel, like Alice in Wonderland, right? Um, this is when Dorothy goes over into Candace to get, then you get this mountain and the mountain is the bit where this stuff happens. This is the adventure, the zone unknown. You need to test allies, enemies, and then you need to return. I've done um, working, working with some of these companies and have worked with a bunch of these companies on, on this. And this work has taken me into the world of the experience economy. So I'm a, I work for the Department for International Trade as a sector specialist in the experience economy. I founded this thing, the World Experience Organization. I've just been put to the, uh, the executive committee of Expresso, the Experience Research Society, which is a global collection of scientists who study experience design, coming at it from a, a well-being, positive design, user experience, customer experience, um, and other experience design practice. I appear to be the only person who isn't a, um, doesn't have a PhD and doesn't teach in a university involved with that, which is kind of weird, but I'll try and do my best to keep up with those people. But but I see my work and you, you think about that stuffication and time has been at the work that I've done is talking to people cleverer than me with big important ideas and trying to translate those to other people so that we can all benefit from the research that's being done. The magic of this WXO is I've got the luck to be in contact with some of the world's great experience designers from um, Dorothy Di Stefano in uh, Adelaide, I think she is, to uh, Daryl Choi in Shanghai, who's the first uh, guy to write a book in Chinese about the experience economy, to, um, ah, that's, you're going to see some of the people, but it's from, from Buenos Aires to Helsinki. So that's, And I thought what would be interesting and fun, rather than just talk about my ideas, is to borrow from some of these people who really understand experience design and see what we can steal from them, see what we can borrow from them to think about how we spend our time. So let's start with this. This was uh, drawn up by a fantastic guy called Kevin Dully, who actually works in banking thinks about the design of experiences for banking customers and how to make them better. And the concepts come from a guy called Joe Pine. He's the guy, he's the, the godfather of the experience economy. He co-wrote the book. And this is, I'm trying to think of the best place to start here, but he's got this 5E structure. You can probably see that here, enticing, entering, engaging, exiting, extending. And it's really, this is about thinking about um, the structure of, of something. Think about Secret Cinema, for example. At the end of seeing the movie, um, you will end up in the bar. So there's a really nice moment where you get to not just um, exit. You think about the way that in the old world when we used to go to the cinema and theater. Anybody remember what that was like? Um, you know, at the end of it, and going to a, a football match or something, at the end, they just chuck you out, they just, you just leave. And they're missing out on a huge opportunity to extend the experience and make the exit part of the experience and then extend it a little bit as well. And I'm just gonna, here's a lovely quote from Joe. The most precious resource on the planet is time for individual human beings. And the number one competitor to their time is the smartphone. I'm just gonna pause there for a moment, just simply because if you want to be happier, put your phone down. 
the O of stories is outside and on, offline. If you look at Nir Eyal's book, Indistractable, um, if you look at the research, if you look at Adam Alter's book, um, Irresistible, uh, if you look at Gene Twenge's research, it's very clear the more you time, time you spend on that device, well, for a start, it's time that you could be talking to your children or your partner. You could be in the real world doing something. I'm not anti-smartphones, I have one. You know, we have devices, we use technology. The key is to use them wisely rather than have them use us. Adam Alter's work looking at addiction is very interesting. Um, if you think about alcohol, who doesn't enjoy a beer or a glass of wine, but there's a huge difference between use and abuse. And it's the same with smartphones. Okay, this curious, wonderful thing is from a company called Meow Wolf, which is possibly the world's coolest immersive experience firm in the world. Started in Santa Fe by a guy called Vince Cadlubeck, now opening in Vegas this year and in, I think it's Boulder, Colorado as well. And I don't know about you, but when I see this, you know, it's instantly familiar, but what is going on there? And if you look closely, there's a leg coming out of that thing. There's a person in there. Just think about that for a moment. This is from Vince. He told us this. Childhood is the inspiration of so much of what we do. As we get older and become adults, we settle into identities and we live in predictable urban landscapes. Think about the house you live in. Think about how we get to know who we are, where we are, the way things work. We lose our sense of wonder and our drive to discover. Unknown environments help us to rediscover those lost things. Remove this thing. Boost creativity and help us to re-engage with the real world. So what does that mean for us? How do we get back that sense of wonder? How do we get back the idea of discovering? I think that's particularly challenging in today's world because of lockdown. It'd be really easy for me to say, you know, go and find an unknown environment. But maybe your local park's okay. Maybe there's another park that you haven't been to. Maybe there's some streets you haven't walked down. Maybe there's books you haven't picked up. Maybe there's, maybe you always watch dramas and maybe you should watch some documentaries. Maybe, I'm playing with this for a moment. I mean, we discovered different parks, um, you know, different places to go. And if you do something different, it kind of fires you back into being aware of what's happening and being alive and being awake. This is the uh, legitimate Peaky Blinders Festival. What I love about this is people in, in outfits and people in kind of their normal clothes. And um, Martin, who's also involved with the w, uh, WXO, is the immersive theatre director for there and also Boomtown Festival. Um, he's just written a really fantastic piece for us about how he's had to pivot online and the journey he's been on. But look, this, this is, he came back to me with this, make discoveries, not decisions, turn stones over and see what you discover. I say that because it's really interesting. I went to him and said, you know, what's your framework? How do you go about doing this? And he said, well, it doesn't, he doesn't really have a framework. He finds out as he goes, but it comes back to this idea of curiosity. And when we're stuck in the four walls of home, I think it's easy just to give up being curious. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to lockdown coming to an end and getting out and doing stuff that we not just haven't done for a while, but really turning over some stones and seeing what we can discover. I love this. Some of you watching this may have been, this is Time Run. Time Run, I think, is in the world's top five escape rooms. It's one of the, I think, certainly most popular in London. Um, and this is from Sheena, who's the co-creator of that and also runs this firm, Yonder Beyond. And, and I, she gave me quite a lot of things to share. And I just wanted to, this I thought was the most practical in terms of thinking about what you do with your time. So think about your purpose when you're doing something. Don't just, don't just wander into your weekend. How many of us just wander into the weekend and go, oh my God, it's the weekend, it's here because we're working so hard. I mean, just, you know, go back to the idea of me high cheek sent me high, that we just assume that we're good at spending our time. We're just like, yeah, of course I know what to do. But think about what your purpose is. Why are we doing this? Who's it for? What do we want people to feel? Maybe when you're designing a Sunday dinner, maybe you're designing, um, you know, your Saturday hanging out with the family. Think about what you want people to feel. And back to secret cinema. So these guys are the masters. I also a huge fan of punch drunks as well. One of the things they do really well, I think, is that bit with the, the lead up, the anticipation. So you receive emails in the run up to going to a secret cinema event to get you excited about thinking about it. But also on the journey there, and I live in London, so we always take the tube when we go. Um, 
and you see other people who are also dressed up, who are obviously going there. And as you see them, you get a bit excited. The thing about anticipation is it's free happiness. You may have seen this thing the other day in the news about the minister saying that we shouldn't book our holidays for the future and we should wait and see. The man's an idiot. We should all be booking holidays and putting plans in for the future. If they change, that's fine. And what we need is travel companies to have the flexibility of the booking conditions. But we should all be making plans because even if plans change, you get the enjoyment of looking forward to them and that's nothing but free happiness. And then when you get into an experience, I mean, this is great because there's a purpose to it, coming back to what Sheena said, you know, what's the purpose? And when my brother and I went, we, we negotiated with Jawas. Um, we got thrown into prison with Chewbacca. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a fantasy life for a couple of middle-aged men. Uh, we went to Obi-Wan's Kenobi's house. Um, and, and at the end of it, we landed in the bar. So we then saw the movie. The whole thing was super exciting with the lightsaber battle and stuff. But then you go to the bar and you land. One of the mistakes that people make with any kind of experience is they try and fill it with peak moments. They just want, look, we've got to make it and we've got to extend, we've got to get the most out of our weekend and stretch it right to the very end. And I don't know if you've ever done that, but then you go into the week and you almost feel like you need a weekend. And that's actually badly designed time. What you should do with experience, think about that, that um, uh, the mountain that I showed before. You need to land at the end of an experience. And that's not just so you can be calm, but it's a chance for, for um, to reflection on the time that you've had to enable your, your system to think about it and to, to actually savor it and get the most out of it. At the beginning of an experience, you should, you should search and at the end, you should savor. At the beginning, you should explore and at the end, you should exploit. So the beginnings and the ends are quite different. So I hope I've given you a sense there of how you can design time and think about the design of your time, why it's important to design time, and how you can do it in a better way so you're more likely to be happy, focused, creative, and successful. Any questions? Thanks so much for that, James. Tyler, I think you had a few questions. I did, yeah. But for while people are, are busily typing their questions, um, I'm glad you mentioned the, the peak moments part, because um, I was starting to think in, um, I don't know if, if you've come across, you might have come across Daniel Kahneman's work. Um, and, uh, you know, he, one of the things he talks about is the uh, the peak end theory. So I'm curious about that, like the peak end. Uh, so uh, roughly speaking, peak end theory is that like we remember the things that are like the peak moments, the most intense things and also the how the ending of something was. So I'm kind of curious now, since we kind of started talking about in the very beginning experience, uh, you know, nowadays, like, are there any ways we can build that into our everyday experiences? PKN theory, can that somehow make um, our everyday lives now when we're not able to go to the secret cinemas and the, um, uh, you know, kind of like, you know, lar larger sort of trip things? Like, could we use that to our advantage in some way to add a little color to our are, are somewhat monochrome COVID lives? Great question, thank you. Um, so yes, um, Daniel Connors mentioned many times in the book, I'm a big fan of his work. And you know, he and people like Barbara Fredrickson came up with the peak end rules. And the way, I, the reason I call it the B rules, which is basically the peak end rules plus the beginning, is that there's some research from um, a chap and his team in New Zealand that shows that what happens at the beginning is also has a really big impact on, on our lives um, and our, our, how we remember things. My take on this is, yes, thinking about the ending is really important. The end of your week uh, is uh, the end of your day is super important. Think about the joy of the Friday night drinks. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an, I know we can't do that now, but actually, yes, the, 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 but the, the peaks are the things we should fo focus on. There's um, FANU or NAFU is the way I remember it, flow or new and unusual. The, the easiest ways to be clear that you are going to... Um, have a peak experience are so you can use the dog funk rules that which is delete distractions be active have risk and if, you, if you're just doing a, a drab piece of work set a timer get it done in a quicker time and put yourself against that but also if you're doing a piece of work that needs to be presented to somebody to a client or let's say the way i spent this afternoon suddenly saying right okay now i need to prepare this presentation okay i had a deadline i knew i wanted to do a, a good job i hope it's been okay um and putting together, so I was on the phone to um, Sheena and other people pulling in images because I wanted it to look good. That risk was fun. 
you know, peak moments. It, and that's what, uh, delete distractions. So that's a re really good example. Where do you have your phone when you work? Do you have it next to you? Okay, good. So the first thing is to keep your phone somewhere away from you, probably put it on silent, that way you can actually get into uh, flow and focus on the work that you need to get done. So that's one easy way. When you take a walk, don't take your phone with you. Go for a walk, notice the nature, um, and actually stop your brain thinking about things and then do something unusual. Maybe there is, uh, I'm trying to think of unusual things. I have a paddle board and I went paddle, I went on the, and I lived fairly close to the Thames and I went in the dark, which was probably a stupid thing to do, but it was really surreal and kind of scary and weird. I was the only person on the water and that was definitely, and I, I took a little speaker with me and had a bit of Rolling Stones playing and it was super fun and very unusual. When I go for a run, I try to go different places. Um, so that's new, new things uh, running. Oh, this is terrible. I run a different direction around the park sometimes. I started taking this week, I started taking my kids around the park and getting them to run as well. And they get a reward because outside and offline is also about exercise. And the guy who discovered running, uh, this wonderful, I want to say Scottish guy, he grew up in Glasgow. Uh, he originally came over from the pogroms in Eastern Europe, but he is the guy who discovered that jogging was good for us. And when he was a boy, his father would make him go for a long walk. And if they walked it within a certain time, he'd get a chalk ice. And so I'm trying to get my kids into it. And that has been fun this week. As in, so yeah, flow, I mean, I've got th those tricks about risk, um, but goals and feedback is really important there. Yeah, that's some ways that you can try and make uh, lockdown a bit more pleasant. Yeah, interesting, great. We have a number of questions, Sarah, did you want to, um, there's a lot of different questions here. So I got to ask one because I know other people are thinking about it for the Star Wars, uh, the secret cinema experience. Why were you talking to Jawas in the thing? There's no Jawas in Empire Strikes Back. That's crazy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm done. I'm done after that. Everyone else can ask. That is, a great, that is a great detailed question about Star Wars. And I really appreciate that. Um, we were on Tatooine. All right. Okay. Is, you may not have seen Tatooine in, in Empire Strikes Back, but of course it was there. Just because you didn't see them doesn't mean they weren't there. Come on. Um, and there was, a, there was a mission that we'd been given. The year before, a couple of years back, I'd been to Casablanca and we'd had a mission there. I wrote about that in my first book, Stuffocation. And we'd had a mission there, uh, which was to like uh, try and get the papers for, you know, so that we could get out of Casablanca. And uh, I'd end up getting caught by these Nazis. It was, it was pretty scary. And I got frog marched down the room. But by having a purpose, and, but, but, you know, in, in a fun way. So the Jawas thing, we ended up having to negotiate with the Jawas because we got given a a, a, perp, a a task that we had to do. So this is again, coming back to secret cinema and the way that they, they use these very clever, simple tricks to get you into the story and give you something to do that makes you feel good. This is why sport is so powerful. I bought a tennis racket and um, it arrived the day that we went into lockdown this just now because the magic of sport is you've got this um, controlled space where there's something that you need to do and you need to respond playing music jazz is a it's a really good example of something called um, co-create you know, interactive flow it's much easier to get into flow when you're doing it with someone else you know when you're trying to meditate and you can't really focus uh, and you want to focus and you're trying really hard and there's you know it, flow on your own can be quite tricky but if you're doing it with someone else, if you're dancing with your kids in the kitchen and you're kind of like responding to what somebody is doing or jazz music's perfect or playing tennis or playing football, because you have to respond to what's going on. There's lots of things going on in your mind. You are in flow. So um, you can borrow ideas from, um, yeah, from, but anyway, so yeah, the Jawas are in Empire Strikes Back. Great question. <laughs> Love the detail. That Followed by somebody who found uh, it quite important to ask what made the movie more memorable than your son's birth. I think you're getting taken to task over that one. <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> my son's birth. I mean, look, kids are born every day. How many times do you go to secret cinema? <laughs> ah. So we got another one here, more serious. Could you recommend an experience that's COVID safe and responsible to do during lockdown? So I think that's one of those things of, are there these kind of experiences that you can design or engage with during this period? The, the, the thing I want to ask, is that person in a relationship with someone? Because there are things you can do that you can really get into flow. 
um and if you live but if you live on your own maybe you should dance with with friends over a zoom call or dance with your family you know dance in the morning um you know when you get up especially during lockdown i think that you know you don't want to just have coffee um having a dance in the morning play queen play um you know eminem play something that kind of like hits you there and jump around like a loony you'll get right into the zone the other thing i recommend is the rsc thing the dream which is out i think on the 12th of march um it's it's free it's actually free it's amazing and, and what we, we've had um actually sheena gave a comment that i mentioned earlier and a few other people uh, involved with this world experience organization because what they're doing is they're taking something called unreal engine which is this awesome software they used to, used to make software but now they're using it for uh drama and making tv shows and stuff as well and they're doing some sort of live interactive play that you can be involved with if you pay 10 pounds it's 10 pounds per device you can be involved and interact and help influence what happens in the story and i was talking to uh trying to think now i think it was a guy in la this guy called noah nelson at no proscenium i think it was him anyway who said that what you should do here is you should actually watch it twice once where you pay your 10 pounds to to be involved and the other time where you don't pay you just watch it for free because you have two different experiences so that's on from the 12th, I think, for about a week or so. And it's the RSC working with these crazies called the Marshmallow Laser Feast uh, and some other people up in Manchester. So it's a re what's really interesting here as well is that it's pretty groundbreaking. It's pretty interesting. And it's also the RSC are involved. So this is going to be kind of interesting and fun. That will be a really cool experience. And that's um, less than a month, about a month away. There's another question here, related question from Andrew, um, talking about um, when you mentioned focusing less on stuff and more on experiences, what would you say about making stuff, which is kind of an experience in itself? Hmm. I'm not anti-stuff, just to be really clear. Uh, I'm not even anti-mass-produced things. My kids had, have Lego. We have, that was the other thing I called my, my parents today um, to see if they had any pictures of us with our Star Wars stuff as kids. When I wrote that book, Stuffication, my mum turned up in fact, at the door just down below from where I'm talking to you from now with a big box. And she said, oh, I've been reading your book, by the way. Here's your Star Wars toys. It was this one. She said, I've had a clear out. Here, take your stuff. Um, I've got no problem with stuff. You know, if you want to um, surf, you need a surfboard. If you want to ski, you need skis. If you want to, uh, if you want to do, if you, you know, if you want to do something, you need stuff to do that thing. Um, absolutely. You know, there's something called the Ikea effect. I'm mentioning Daniel Kahn of behavioral psychology. Um, the Ikea effect is this wonderful thing that, of course, when you make something, it has more meaning for you. Um, so, you know, whittling, making things, um, you can possibly see there's a picture that my daughter's been drawing, you know, stuff that you make is great. I've got no problem with stuff. Um, just really the key in life should be, if you think you're going to get status and happiness by buying things that are external to you, and that's the problem with materialism. There's a wonderful bit, book uh, by a guy called Tim Kasser called The High Price of Materialism. When the problem, one of the big problems with materialism is we start to believe that happiness exists external to ourselves. Then one of the magical things about this experientialism, and I do get a little bit possibly annoyingly evangelical about, about this, but if we move from materialism to being experientialist, by definition, we start to get look for our identity inside of ourselves rather than outside of ourselves. And uh, that means we tend to be more intrinsically motivated rather than extrinsically motivated, which all leads to more happiness. Materialism tends to lead to um, disassociation and, and unhappiness. So you're better off to be experientialist than materialistic. Hmm. So with that, somebody has asked, um, how would you redesign education? Because so much of our education is designed towards measurability and tests and performance. How would you redesign education? <laughs> oh, that's a really simple question. I'm just going to give a question off the bat and, and solve everything. Um, I've got no problem with tests. I don't understand why people have a problem with tests at all. Sorry, I, I, this just is a personal thing. I'm not a, an expert in education at all. I think there are really interesting experiments happening in the design of um, experience, um, educational experience as well. Um, but life is a test, no? Things are testing, things are tough. Why not get used to it? Why not do them? I'm not saying, you know, I think it's the realization that we will fail at things 
is really good for resilience. If you look, and I'm not going to jump in here, but if you look at the hero's journey, there's this wonderful bit that's absolutely essential. Oh, Elizabeth, that's interesting. Repeated testing drums the creativity out of kids. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, I mean, in my life as a person who's been working for 25 years or so now, um, I feel like I've constantly been tested, but the challenge is how do you be creative to solve the problems? If you go back to this idea of the hero's journey, what, one of the most powerful things about it is that it's the first chapter of the, of the book about the importance of story in terms of our experiences, is if you think about the hero in your favorite story, that hero doesn't become a hero by not doing anything. They have to beat the baddie. They have to climb the mountain. Um, you think about Cinderella as a wonderful example of this, okay? So there's Cinderella. She has a mum and a dad, and um, her mum dies, and her dad remarries. Not very good. Then the dad dies, and she's stuck with that awful stepmother and the sisters, and she's kind of stuck in this awful place. It's, and then she meets the guy, and she ends up very happy, and there's obviously the, the slipper and stuff. But just think for a moment if the story had been, here's a girl with her mum and dad. She met the prince and was lived happily ever after. There's no story. It'd be a terrible story. It wouldn't be the story of Cinderella. Just think about Luke Skywalker, if I can borrow from, um, from Star Wars. He has to beat the small baddie, the bigger baddie, the bigger baddie. And then ultimately, you know, the ultimate baddie, the emperor, whatever they do. You know, there's always, it's always the same story over and again. Or if you think about Moana, Moana, the, the um, brilliant Disney movie, or lots of movies. Think about the movie 1917. We have to have these tests. We have to have these challenges, challenges to find out who we are. So heroes, in order to be a hero, you have to face down tests. You have to face and deal with enemies. And to do that, you need to also say, um, Elizabeth Hallworth, I, I have teacher friends too. I, I can't solve, I don't think I can solve the education system in this call. Um, but the thing is as well, so you think about the, the stories that we, that we enjoy, we are all the protagonists of our own story. We are the, I'm the main character in my story. Tyler, you're the main character in your story. Georgia, Sarah, you guys are the main characters in your stories and everyone else is a bit player. And it's the same, same for everybody else who's on this, who's listening here, who's watching this. And so the thing is, in order to be a hero and save the universe and have an exciting, challenging, meaningful life, it can't just all be easy. We need stuff to happen. And if you look at resilience and the building of resilience and Angela Duckworth's book, Grit, for example, um, and you, you look at how you build resilience, if you look at the uh, APA, the American Psychological Association's um, list of the 10 things you should do to build resilience. They almost fit hand in glove with the reasons why experiences are better than material goods at making us happy. When stuff happens in your life and it isn't perfect, you have a chance to build resilience. That's why sports are so important. That's why failure is so important. We need bounce back. But anyway, I don't think I've solved the problem with education. So... We also have another question here about adverse experiences. So we've kind of alluded to the fact that some people may have yeah. adverse experiences of different things. What do you have to say about them? They're awesome. One of the things that I do with um, people when I'm sometimes doing um, these talks, um, I did this in a TEDx talk, um, was I get people to tell stories to each other about time when something's gone wrong in their life. And if you can imagine me as a southerner, someone from um, Surrey, just south of London, with 2,500 uh, Mancunians, try, uh, this is where the TEDx talk was, TEDx Manchester, trying to get these Mancunians to do this, you know, because whenever I get groups of people to play this game, they all look at me with a look of utter dread. Nobody wants to tell that kind of story because we all show up with this, hey, everything's fine. Oh, everything's good. Oh, yeah, oh, it's some tough times, but we're, we're getting through it. The thing is about when things go wrong, is it gives you an opportunity to have a hero's journey. Because the hero's journey, I didn't show that version, but it was sometimes been called the man in whole story by a guy called Kurt Vonnegut, a uh, American writer. Um, but as he said, it didn't have to be a man, doesn't have to be a whole. And that's why I give the example of Cinderella. Cinderella, in order for Cinderella to have a decent story and to be worth caring about. And I've seen that story a few times because my kids like it, we got it on DVD. Um, stuff had to happen, stuff had to go wrong for her. 
And if we go back, do you remember that domino line to happiness that starts with stories? You have an experience that gives you a story. Story fires up the mirror neurons and connects you to other people. The best kind of story, so story that maybe I should say that story is considered to be an evolutionary adaptation. It's the thing that's enabled us to, to connect with other people and come together in large groups. The best kind of story to tell, the evolved shape of story is the hero's journey. It's the one that we like to hear. And when you tell a story to somebody else, what you want is for their mirror neurons to fire up along with yours, because that will create empathy, which will lead to connection, relationships, happiness, etc. And just think for a moment, if you've ever been um, on a date and on a bad date, anybody here ever been on a bad date? This is the, you know, when I've given talks like that, you can see people, and then some people who can remember them viscerally, and they're like, oh my God. But you know, when you go on a bad date and someone starts talking about something you just don't care about, maybe they start talking about Star Wars and they're as boring as me, or maybe they talk about squash, um, you know, or something you just don't care about. Your mirror neurons go, no thanks. Your brain's not ready to fire up. The thing about telling a story in the shape of the hero's journey is that even if you don't recognize the specific local details of that story, you recognize the shape of the hero's journey. You recognize the shape where here's a person, bad things happened, shit happened. It went wrong in some way and they came out the other side. And the reason why our brains are ready to fire and the mirror, mirror neurons are primed in that situation is because it's all of our story. Every single one of us has had something in their life that has gone wrong. We failed to, to we failed an exam. We got caught cheating. I don't know at school in life. Um, we failed to get a job. We got sacked. We got caught doing something we shouldn't have done at work. We sent an email to the wrong person. We we messed up in some way. And so when you, but we came through it. And so when you tell a story to somebody that is the kind of this, I, okay, this is a slight aside, I think this is one of Donald Trump's problems, because he always said, I, he always had this boom bastic, I'm great, I, you know, I did this. And the other. Imagine if he'd said, you know, I used to have a lot of money and then things went really wrong for me in the 90s. I lost a lot of money, but, you know, I tried hard, I worked as I could and I came back again. You'd probably like him to a little bit more. I mean, OK, let's not push this, but you know what I mean. So when you tell a story in the shape of the hero's journey, it's, it's all of our story, but also not only on a personal basis, but on a very deep human basis. Because if you think about our ancestors coming from East Africa and spreading out across the globe, they had to cross mountains, cross water. They had to fight the locals, they had to fight the, the Neanderthals, they had to fight the cave hyenas. Um, in the case of Americans, of course, they literally had to cross the ocean, but they had to get over problems. They were people with a problem and they solved it. They've been through the hero's journey. So on a very, it's also the story that every society tells. The Battle of Britain is a super example of a, of a hero's journey. The uh, Thanksgiving story of, this, of, the Ameri of, of the Americans, for example. But all societies have these archetypal stories that tell them who they are, that bring them together. So when you have an adverse thing and something goes wrong in your life, you're like, why me? Why? This is, this is not fair. This is what that does for you, actually, is it gives you a story that is in the shape of the hero's journey. And when you tell that to story to somebody, you are more likely to lead them uh, in business, in the boardroom, to bed, in war, whatever. You think about the great leaders of our time. They'll tell a story that goes like this. Wow, look at where we are. Things are about to be really tough. But come with me and I will take you to the promised land. And the reason they do that is because everybody's mirror neurons fire up. We have empathy. We connect. That's how leaders win. So every time something goes wrong, this is one of the reasons I, I love this, this particular thing about the importance of story. Every time something goes wrong for you, it actually is giving you an opportunity to connect with people, to be a leader, maybe even to get laid more often. So one of the attendees is also asked, kind of taking that forward, what would you say to a generation of young people who don't have the luxury of time or financial security to book things like holidays and where there's structural issues like jobs and house security like at the moment in light of the pandemic and other things, who've left university with tens of thousands of pounds of debt um, and doubts about the future with the climate crisis and the like, 
how does your approach fit into that kind of broader context? Um, and how do you approach this when it's not quite as individualistic? Wow. Well, this is why this is the intellectual forum. Um, so I need to pronounce why, make a statement about why the, the younger generation should, it, it sounds like this person thinks that everything is awful for these people. Um, I just fundamentally don't believe that. So maybe that's, um, but <laughs> there's, this, there's this amazing weird fantasy uh, just to give you a bit of background is I'm a cultural analyst and been um, a, a, a cultural analyst and a forecaster, trend forecaster since 2004. Um, so not so long, but, you know, uh, some time. And um, if you look at human societies, there's always this sort of fantasy that things used to be OK and easy. <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, it was all really clear in the 80s. All we had to worry about was nuclear war, actually. In the 80s, that was kind of a big deal. And the 90s and the Berlin Wall fell down at was it, 89 or whenever it was. And, oh, that was all bright. But actually, you know, Samuel Huntington with the, you know, the clash of civilizations and every era has its things to be worried about. And, the, you know, the so this kind of, you know, this insecurity and this, that and the other. Humans have had a pretty tough time of it for, you know, since we emerged, what, 150, 200,000 years ago. Um, the biggest problem for most people for most of that time was putting food on the table. Uh, th th take obesity as a really good example here. Yeah? I mean, obesity is a, sorry for those people that have got those issues, but it's a comedy situation because imagine saying to somebody a hundred years ago that one of the defining problems of our era would be obesity. A hundred, you know, so go back to, um, you know, um, 1921 and saying to people that we'll have so much food to eat a huge problem in the uk will be too much food and people will just all be you know obese they would have bitten your arm off the biggest problem for most humans has been can i get enough food to feed my family to keep them alive and you know to put food on the table and you know go back to pre uh you know industrial society you know go back to before 1750 and you know we were living pretty simple lives. So um, I'm not. I'm, I don't mean to say that people don't have. There aren't challenges for people. Um, but you know, large amounts of people are educated nowadays, and that just wasn't the case. My father was the first person in our family to go to university. My great great auntie, I think, or his auntie, you know, got a place to go to Oxford back in the 30s. But we they couldn't afford to send her. Um, and not many people used to go to university. So if people are coming out of university with debt and an education, well, okay. If you look at a book, Status Syndrome, um, and this is why the final S of the story is thing is status and significance. Um, people with higher status live longer, better lives. And um, the closest correlation uh, it's it, money's important, of course, but education. So people with a PhD live longer than people with a master's degree who live longer than people with a normal degree who live longer than someone uh, who leaves school at 18, who lives longer than someone who leaves school at 16. This is in the broad numbers, of course. And, you know, this is this is stuff that uh, the WHO has looked at. So this is why um, inequality in our society, I think, is an issue. But look at so um, if you leave university with a lot of debt but you have some education you have some possibilities in life and if the thing that bothers you is the problem with the um environment then go find a startup and there is a i'm involved with something called carbon 13 which is run by my former tutor at the judge a guy called chris Coleridge. and carbon 13 is a wonderful accelerator with uh, um you know he's he's raised a few million pounds um, and got some incredibly clever people involved. And the idea is to create um, a whole bunch of startups that take carbon out of the atmosphere. And there are lots of smart people trying to do that kind of thing. So if, if someone is um, really bothered about those problems, do something about it. I think it's a bit like football fans. We all sit on the sidelines sort of moaning, saying, oh, the manager doesn't know what he's doing. Well, maybe do something about it. So we have I, know, I, know, I know that's a little simplistic, but you know, here we are, we're, you know, we can be glass half empty, we can be glass half full, or we can be, wow, we've got a glass. We've actually got an opportunity to do something. 
and to be alive and to have our opportunity and therefore how we spend our time it's incredibly precious thing that we have you know we're all lucky to be alive and the reason we're lucky to be alive is because our ancestors were greedy every one of us here um we're the product this is this is why obesity is a problem in society because humans have gone through times of scarcity scarcity was the the modus operandi for humans for most of the time uh you know finding enough food etc and you would never be that far away from some sort of famine or shortage and so seafood eat food was a very smart thing to do until the modern era so we're using mental to tools honed on the you know in times of scarcity in a time of abundance and the reason i'm saying that is that we live in a time of abundance and sure we've got a bunch of problems as well but the problems of scarcity i think are a lot worse than the problems of abundance so we should i was going to say thank god but whatever whatever your religion is you know we should be happy that we've got some problems because there's only one time when the problems stop and that's when you run out of time anyway so we've got some different questions i'll debate obesity with you anytime <laughs> uh, um but somebody has asked a really interesting question that i think is really important to answer we're running out of time so i just want to get to this one which is in daily life what services would you consider a badly designed experience mm. It's an interesting question but the problem here is that services and experiences are different experiences are a distinct uh, economic offering compared to services just in the same way that products and services are different so experiences are different to services um so you know i mean customer service is generally terrible isn't it i'm trying to think of any experiences that i've had but so let me give you an example okay. this is a person's question but like i go to the supermarket i have to shop i have to buy foods arguably as we've discussed there is extensive options and a calorie plethora some of which is good quality and bad but my experience of going into that supermarket can either be a dreadful one which it has been in past lockdown with the masks on and screaming children or it can be a really pleasing experience where you engage with the scent and the different fruits and vegetables and things like going to a market can be super enjoyable with all of the different kind of sensory experiences how can we think about those designs and optimizing what could be a very bad unpleasant experience to design it better to be a good experience that is rewarding to people my take on things is that the starting point is the human um, and the starting point is the human and the hero's journey, therefore, sits at the very heart um, of um, the experience that has meaning for us. Now, how you action that, how you activate that, particularly in that idea of the tests and the enemies, whew, that's interesting, huh? Because nobody wants to make things hard. But experiences are like the opposite of services in some way, in that services are about convenience and experiences are about making something memorable. And there are different, I mean, there's different, you know, you're talking about retail there, for example, there are different speeds of retail. There's sometimes where you just want to get through and you just want a quick service. You want time, services are about time well saved. This is borrowing from Joe Pine. Whereas an experience is about time well invested and time actually that, you know, has some kind of meaning for you. So let's take it as a, a, a grocery store, for example. The, the, the smart design of it would be to offer you two options. One where it, it's very much about getting, get, get in, get out, do the functional stuff that you need to get done. So it's saving your time, that's the good service. But maybe there should be something there that gives you the opportunity to have an experience to maybe delve a bit deeper. Um, I don't know, maybe there's like an Italian section or something and there's somebody cooking or you. there's an opportunity for you to, you know, to get involved and actually have an experience there. Make sense? I think about retail, yeah. And how do you think about where monetization of experience is happening. So somebody's given the example here of Eventbrite having a platform that Airbnb experiences where there is a monetized experience element. So is the question, what, what do I think of monetizing experiences? Yeah, it's awesome, do it. I don't understand what people, People that have, a so having written stuffocation, as you can probably imagine, and there's stuff in there about minimalism, lots of people assume that I was anti 
capitalism and anti-consumerism, um, I would feel incredibly hypocritical to be anti the system that has given us the abundance that we have and the good lives that we have. And it's raised living standards in a way that nothing else has ever done. If you look at living standards until, you know, you know, 17, until the industrial revolutions, living standards were pretty flat for millennia. I mean, okay, they were kind of bumping along slightly. And then along comes the industrial revolution and of course the consumer revolutions and the standards of living have gotten up to such a point that now we don't talk about standards of living as our issue, but quality of life, which is a very different kind of idea. You know, standards of living is, I mean, there is a qualitative aspect as well, but there's a quantitative as side of it, which I think is the starting point. And then we kind of go, Oh, do we like our TV and stuff? So the idea that and I've got, there's a guy called Ben Honeycutt, who's written a lovely book called The Age of Experiences, but it is, is much more, uh, he kind of disagrees with, with me on this. And he has some concerns about the monetization of experience. He believes that the experience economy and people creating experiences have an opportunity to free people from the marketplace and turn them into prosumers who are kind of producer consumers who make their own stuff. Um, I think that if people create value it's pretty reasonable to also capture some of that value and the challenge becomes are we creating enough value that you want to do something and we should take some money from it let's take secret cinema as a, as a super example it is so much fun why shouldn't they make some money um if someone provides you with a really good uh pizza coffee um holiday um provides uh you know, let's say when you go to, you know, university, I mean, when I was at the judge, it was not a cheap course at all, but it was transformational. It was a transformational, amazing experience where I met a bunch of really interesting people from around the world. And I was challenged. And I learned so much stuff. It was incredible. And it was, why shouldn't they charge me money for that? That was an experience. It was an incredible educational experience. Um, and let's take the Airbnb experiences, for example. Let's say you are actually... Ben wrote something about this for us recently about his, he, he wants us to kind of break free from consumerism a bit, but he had gone or he'd booked this trip in, uh, he doesn't live in New York, he lives in Iowa, and he'd booked this trip in, um, what's that place at the top of Manhattan, in Harlem, and he was going to have like a, like a three, four hour experience in Harlem with a local who was going to kind of, you know, take him dancing, and he was, he was going with his grandson, and um, I've been up to Harlem, and I wandered around, I met some people, because kind of do that when I go traveling a little bit but the idea that you'd meet somebody I, I did something like this in Granada with my wife a couple of years back and this guy took us to places we just wouldn't have gone why shouldn't he why shouldn't he make some money uh, Elizabeth Hallworth and I are definitely going to disagree capitalism is okay in the 50s it's gone massively unequal under neoliberalism yeah that's true uh, the 50s and the 60s actually it was becoming more equal um and it, it's later and it, these issues that we have but we still live in a much more equal society compared to the system the way things were previously we just you know on a funny bump at the moment i think i mean the the things you're talking about james the kind of like taking the really long view and answering some of these questions it's very um stephen pinker's better angels of our nature um takes that extremely long view of like yeah like you know quality of life we go back hundreds and thousands of years, violent death, death by disease and all this stuff. It was like, of course it is a better time to be alive than it was ever before. So um, there are different ways to answer that question. And it sounds like you're leaning more towards the, yeah, you know, having diseases of plenty and like, you know, having the basic needs met um, create different problems, but they're not necessarily bigger problems. Yeah, and it's, you know, if you look at um, Hans, Ro is it Hans Rosling's book, um, you know, actually, <laughs> Some of us are lucky. We have the problems of abundance and there are, what is it, about seven, seven and a half billion people on the planet now. And loads of those people don't have the problems of abundance. Um, looking at the work that I've done in terms of being a forecaster, the way that things change is through something called the diffusion of innovations curve. So you get the innovators who go first and the early adopters, the early majority, late majority and things spread through um, societies. And I see that happening in terms of capitalism as well the the innovators who were the americans who really got hold of this and went first particularly consumerism this is really for, from the point of view of capitalism they went first in the 20s and the, obviously there was significant challenges in the 30s and the 40s but the idea of consumerism was strong and therefore 
I mean, obviously West, Western Europe got hold of it first and was like, hold on, you know, this is good for society, it's good for individuals, it's good for governments, it's good for, good for countries. And we're kind of bringing the others along as well. That's my take. And if there is a, if there's a better system for spreading the wealth and bringing these other people, uh, you know, th this is the thing. It's really easy to kind of say cap capitalism is dreadful, driven by consumerism. But the magic actually, I kind of sometimes get into this and maybe this is really off topic and um, is, is pointing towards some of my ignorance. But, you know, in the old world, before we have capitalism as our sort of major system in, in the world, if you wanted to get more money, you had to go and take somebody's country. That was the idea, right? You go and take their country. That was the way to do it. Now what you do is you go in there, you give them money to build factories and turn them into consumers so they can buy your goods. You know, that's you, you have to raise their um, standards of living and their opportunity to buy stuff so they can buy your stuff. And actually, if you want to be successful, you want to grow the pie rather than sort of take a piece of it. So it strikes me as a very positive system as well. And it's, the thing about this experientialism, to bring it back to this slightly, is there are obviously fundamental problems with materialism. It's bad for well-being. It's very bad for the environment. Um, but if we can become experienced consumers, experientialists, it keeps money f flowing through the system. It makes us happier. It's not a silver bullet solution for um, the problems with the environment, but it definitely is not materialism. And it definitely has the opportunity to support solving that problem as well. And one of the things here is about equality. So equality is seen very much from a materialistic point of view. Now, now I, I recognize there are some people, uh, you know, who really don't have enough and that is a challenge. I don't want to kind of, you know, ignore that. But at the same time, if you consider the difference between someone who earns three million pounds a year and a person who earns 30,000 pounds a year, from a material point of view, a materialistic point of view, it's really clear who's winning. Now think about those people in terms of their experiences. Okay. Now, sure, one of them probably goes to the Maldives on holiday or something fancy like that. And the other one maybe goes to uh, Wales camping or goes camping in France or something. I don't know. You know. Um, but what's better, Maldives or going camping in Wales? Camping in Wales is awesome. Because if you're lucky, your tent will blow down. You get to go surfing there. It's brilliant, right? Warm beer on the beach in Wales versus, you know, chilled champagne on a, a you know, one is fancier. But one of the really, and this is, uh, you know, I'm borrowing from psychologists here. There is a more, there is a fuzzier comparison between experiences than there is between material goods. I'm borrowing from uh, Tom Gilovich in the States on this. So if you ask people about, about the difference between a five-star and a three-star break, um, if they've been on a three-star break, they tend not to have wanted to swap it for a five-star break because it was their thing. If you think about, think about it in terms of handbags as a, a simple example, if you go into the office, remember we used to go into offices and you've got the Chloe bag, okay, and there's a woman next door and she's got the Topshop version and the woman next door to that has a version that they bought in the market, sort of super cheap, right, okay. There's a distinction between us, and it doesn't bring those people together in terms of like, oh, hey, you've got a handbag like mine, you've got the top shot one. It separates them. Whereas with experiences, let's take camping. You've got one person that goes to a festival and stays in a really wonderful glamping tent. You've got another person who goes to Everest base camp, let's say. And you've got another person who buys a, um, who goes to decathlon. This person here, for example, goes to the cafe and buys the cheapest tent there is, about 85 pounds, and takes his kids to a place about an hour down the road. Those people are not separated in the same way the handbag people are separated. They're all campers. So it's a fuzzier logic. So the thing about the equality, um, and you think about the spirit level, I'm trying to think of the people that wrote the spirit level book. If you look at that work about the, just, the, the problems of equality in our society and the impact that has on well-being, and longevity because of this status thing, because of this, uh, this difference in status, the point of view is materialistic. Who's got more? And that's what bugs people. But if you flip your point of view to being experientialist, the prince may have a fancier life than the prince, than the, the pauper, but it's still just a life. And that perspective, I think, will be good for inequality points of view as well. I think we're just about out of time. Still a lot of questions, especially from Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, so we'll find, James on wall, uh, find James on Twitter, I think, for some of these other questions. But sorry, what was that, James? I can answer them very quickly if you want to do that, or if we're out of time, I, we can do that too. 
I think maybe as a wrapping up question, I'll take one more from the, uh, the top here. Um, uh, like, you know, so now that it is almost the weekend and all of these things, uh, what, what would you recommend for people? Like what, what, what's a reasonable thing, depending on what part of the world they're in? Like, how can, how can we build in some of these kind of like geek experience or some of these things within our means? What should we look forward to um, on Saturday and Sunday? That is a great question. And the one I wish I prepared for. <laughs> um, okay, so the thing about stories, do something really challenging. Uh, or, you know, you could, the, the interesting thing about these stories rules is they kind of support each other. So I, at some point, will be going for a run. I'll be going a run along the river. It's really cold at the moment. That's quite painful and annoying. Um, but so doing, doing, I mean, obviously, we're kind of stuck at home, right? Um, but the other, I mean, one of the things is to, to see this lockdown, not as a kind of like, oh, it's awful, but to realize that this is a, just a test. It's a test for it that we have to get through. And when we come through the other side, we'll feel let free in a really positive way. But we need to go through this stuff because you just think how much, how much we took holidays for granted. Who, who didn't just think, oh, yeah, of course, we'll, we'll have a break, right? You know, um, and now just think how much we're going to appreciate that stuff. Um, you know, this is also kind of about being in the moment and being in flow. One of the things that I do is, is, is turn your phone off. So uh, we'll do this. We will definitely get out. I'll get out with my kids to the park and we'll leave the phone at home. So go out in the cold, put a coat on, deal with it or wherever you, you know, go out and do something, try and find something difficult to do. I've injured my finger, so I won't be climbing trees with the kids. and It's too cold. But um, hanging out with my family, put the phone down and make sure I'm really present there with them. Super I have stuff. another one that I know that somebody's um, that somebody who does experiences from Australia. You mentioned somebody from Adelaide builds scent experiences you can do at home. So scents and getting like one really interesting thing to do at home is to get things that smell different and experience scent at home and change the smell of your house by cooking things and bringing things in from outside. And one thing we often forget is scent and how much that can evoke experiences that you've had before. That's a really good point. Uh, music and um, sense are, are really powerful for bringing back uh, memories. The, the thing is, as you're saying, I'm just thinking, because my kids do that, but we do it in the summer. Um, and I'm just thinking every time I cook anything and don't close all the doors and light a candle, my wife gets very cross. So it's not going to work for my house, but I like your idea. I think it's a really good one. Um, yeah, music is a good one too, huh? What about, um, you know, not excessively weird, but playing we'll do this at some point I know this weekend and we'll all dance around the kitchen and because my kids like Disney movies we'll play some Disney music or that um what's that guy um the greatest showman and it makes the family dance and the awesome thing actually we, I sometimes do is, the great thing is you need to do silly dancing and next thing you know you're slightly embarrassed and then you're in flow because you're taking risks Sounds like a great idea. Well, James, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know a lot of people still have questions that we didn't quite get to. So there is the opportunity to interact with James and the Intellectual Forum and Tyler at the Think Lab via our Twitter feeds. We obviously will be taking time away from our phones, so it may not be an instantaneous response. But that said, there is a great opportunity to send us some inquiries. And then we will also be coming back in the next couple of weeks and having a series of discussions about technology and our social and um, our well-being aspects of technology. Um, we've got an upcoming event, don't we, Tyler? A conjoined one with the Think Lab and the Intellectual Forum hosting the social dilemma to talk about the things that came up in that Netflix documentary. And we've got some other events that are shortly going to be ticketed, including one again with the Think Lab talking about um, technology and society going forward and digital distraction and various different things like that. So we'll be picking up a lot of these themes over coming months. It'd be great if you would join us for those. Do feel free to follow the Intellectual Forum and the Think Lab and James to see all these wonderful things coming up. And we'd love to hear from you in the future. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Appreciate it.